friends, uh, this is the last session of this two-day kind of, uh, conversations that we had. And we are very fortunate, uh, the chief of our own frog, uh, Reverend Dr. Satyanathan Glark, uh, is going to give the concluding, you know, remarks as well as concluding, you know, presentation of uh, this two days uh, discussion. I don't think any one of you here will know any introduction to Satyanathan Clark and uh, who was teaching at United Theological College many years. And we both were uh, colleagues in the Karnataka Central Diocese in two of their churches. And uh, we cherish that kind of a leadership that he has given to the church's ministry involved in various activities of the church still people remember this impact, that impact that he has created in those churches. And Satinadhan Clark uh, as present is a professor of theology and culture and mission at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. At this moment, he is on sabbatical and joining with the uh, mother and the children and the grandchildren enjoying the family union at this point of time. Thank you, Sandeep, taking your time off to be available to us this uh, afternoon. And uh, we know that uh, the inspiration in which that you have involved in the church's ministry earlier, as well as continuing to do that in, in, even though you are outside. And also at this point of time, we recognize and acknowledge the services rendered by Right Reverend Sundar Clark in the Madras Diocese and Clara Clark among the women in the diocese. So we recognize their contribution that they made. And you are following the legacy left behind your parents. And I am looking forward for your presentations as we gather here this afternoon. A warm and cordial welcome to you. Over to you, Sati. Thank you, Reverend Vincent. Um, I always called him Anand. Um, he was like an older brother to me. As he said, I worked for several years with him on various projects while I was in UTC Bangalore. So um, it's real privilege actually for me to be here, even as he takes leave after yeoman service with the Christian Institute for the study of religion and society. Um, I also uh, 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 know uh, Dr. Vinay Raj um, very well. I've read most of his work um, and it's a great privilege for me to welcome him um, to this esteemed institution. Um, I had the honor of serving um, on the general body of um, Christian Institute for the Study of Religion and Society. So it's, it's a real privilege for me to be with you today. So I have up in front of you outline of what I will share with you. Um, I've been working with Zoom and Skype and a lot of my lectures are there. So I know how difficult it is to try and concentrate and look at the same face constantly when the face really is somewhere in cyberspace. So I, I have some slides that will hopefully make it a little easier. So I thought I'll give you a sense of what I'd like to do. Um, my, my title um, uh, is Religion as Ethical Practice of Justice in the Public Square. Uh, and what I'd like to do based on what you have been doing over the next, the last two days is to lift up the challenge that we face from religion and its practice, and also look at the prospect of religion to function as a path of ethical practice for justice in the public square. So, if you'd look at what I will do, uh, I will start with an introduction, um, place before you the challenge that we have in contemporary India primarily, but this is also across the world 
where we do have the rise of what I'm calling muscular religion. Uh, and then we look at the prospect um, and religion as the ethical practice of justice. Uh, and in that, I will present two models, uh, both of them claiming to be ethical. So interestingly, um, when you think about religion in the public sphere, it's not as though the one that in fact is disturbing us, uh, the aggressive form of religion is not interested in ethical practice. It says it is also part of ethical practice. So I look at two models. The first is religion as enforcement of ethics of order in the public square, um, where basically what happens is there is a fashioning of peace, usually in the nation state from the consecrated heads. Uh, and the second model that I think is something that we should continue to work with is religion as ethical performance of justice, where we will look at feet wisdom welling up to liberate the whole body. So it's important to keep in mind where we are in the world today. As all of you know, the world is constantly undergoing change. Some changes are random and unexpected. COVID-19 arrived in early 2020, almost like an invasion. The virus took the uncommon pathway of an interspecies mutation as it made its visitation upon our global family. Ironically, many great nations who spent much of their precious time, energy, and resources trying to keep human bodies controlled within confined spaces appeared embarrassingly unprepared to deal effectively with the onslaught of this deadly virus. A conservative estimate of deaths from COVID-19 is 810,000 in the United States of America and 500,000 in India. So you can see that these self-proclaimed exceptional democratic nations are the two countries with the largest deaths when it came to working with this particular tragedy. Other changes have been more calculating and deliberate. The virus of fear and hate that drives violence against the other human beings based on religion, caste, gender, or race did not need the help of other species. Such violence has a long history of targeting those who did not conform to the normative makeup of human selves as determined by the powerful majority group. In societies across history, unresolved phobia of difference and determined rage against competing worldviews have led to violations, including violence, against such faces of the other that are a threat to the religious, racial, and sexual ideals of an imagined true human being. In what follows, while acutely aware of the tragedy visited upon us by the mercurial coronavirus, I will focus, focus on the trauma perpetuated by the forces of what I am calling muscular religion as they inventively overtake socio-political spaces in our time. This presentation has two segments. I will spend the first part of the talk addressing the nature of religion in the public square. I have analyzed the ascendance of religious fundamentalism globally, especially focusing on United States, Egypt, and India. In this reflection, however, I shall keep the focus mainly on India. I am concerned with uncovering muscular religion working concertedly to colonize the socio-cultural space of nations. So what I am looking at is muscular religion working concertedly to colonize the socio-cultural space of the nation. 
I have referred to this phenomenon of muscular religion in earlier writings as religious fundamentalism or religions pressed to their respective extremes. In the second part of the talk, I will be concerned with the prospect of religion to function as the ethical practice of justice in the public space that is being colonized by muscular religion. So let's go on to uncovering muscular religion. Muscular religion of various stripes are having a field day in the 21st century. The shrink shrinking world is imagined to be a sprawling theater of sacred drama. The gods and goddesses may not be crazy, but their fervent disciples are dispersing fear and trembling in the name of their deities. Such disciplined religious movements are spreading effectively in many regions of the world with amazing political success. These religious movements draw creatively from imperial scriptural sources and toxic theological storehouses to inspire movements in the public square that violently alter the world for their respective deities. There are numerous terms to name the hydra-headed religious beast that is alive and well in our contemporary world. Combative religion, religious extremism, jihadi religion, strong religion, religious fundamentalism, and violent, violent religious nationalism are some of the generic expressions that we know. Others are more religion specific, such as militant Buddhism, Islamic jihadism, vicious Hinduism, and the Christian right. Knowing these various options, I use the term muscular religion to name such violent religious movements, probably aware that this might also translate well to Kshatriya religion, within the Indian context. Most of you have heard about the amazing fundamentalism project that was coordinated by Martin Mardi and Scott Appleby. And they produced five large volumes over six years. Um, uh, and they did for us is that or muscular religions from its confinement to Christianity alone. And they spearheaded a study of several multi-religious movements that were spreading around the world, basically promoting violation of others' rights and spreading violence. Let me briefly place before you the characteristics that they have sketched out in all of these volumes that define muscular religion or religious fundamentalism. First, these movements shrewdly selective, select key events and texts, both within the religious tradition and in relation to the aspects of modern society that it opposes. So there's a certain shrewdness with which only certain texts are picked in order for them to use as a scriptural authority to in fact be involved with violation and violence. But the second aspect of muscular religion is the dualistic worldview. If there is a good, there has to be a bad or an evil. If there is a masculinity, there has to be something of a femininity. And usually what they think about of is masculinity being 
associated with courage and femininity basically being associated with cowardice. And therefore, through this dualistic worldview, they also then can easily think of themselves as being part of all the things that were thought of as good, masculine, beautiful, rational, and all the others that therefore should be conquered in order for there to be order in society. Third, there's an allegiance to an absolutist view of scripture. Fourth, there's a reinforcement of the sense of an elect, a chosen membership, separated by sharp boundaries from outsiders. You can see how this works within our own caste system in India. And finally, there's an uncritical acceptance of organizational authoritarianism, where you have a style of leadership that is accepted and people follow this in order to fulfill what they think religion desires them in the world. So stitching elements of these traits with creativity and cunning, passionately faithful foot soldiers of Hindutva take to the extreme the quest for certitude within their own religious ranks by violently demolishing the moral convictions and ethical practices. Thus, muscular religion aggressively asserts there is only one valid way and then publicly co-opts or expels those who do not think and behave like they do. The nation state, which governs how people act based on how they think, becomes an important vehicle in transforming a parochial religion into a national one. So violence associated with religious extremism is not a modern phenomenon. All of us who have studied history know this. So the history of religions is littered with instances of intra-religious and inter-religious violence. Raymond Panikkar, who knows multiple religions well says, religion includes what is best in human beings, but religion has also produced what is worst what is most wicked. Religion has not only been an opiate, but a poison as well. Perhaps what is most disturbing in our time, nation states collide with one another in the interest of serving the ideologies of power strident religious movements strategically and systematically in league with other economic, political, and cultural forces are in the business of seeking to carve out strong nation states for the well-being of their own religious adherents. The nation state thus is captured by muscular religion for the purposes of establishing religious nationalism. Indeed, it seems that religious fundamentalism and ideologically driven nationalism are deeply entwined in a self-serving manner. We must keep in mind that Hindu nationalism is one representation of the global transfiguration of religions over the last 30 years. Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, and Muslim muscular religions also need legitimate public platforms to translate hallowed beliefs into mundane practices. Upholding and cultivating strong belief, logical ingredients that go into the configuration of violent religious movements. Cognizant within headstrong believers must also be accompanied by stringent mechanisms to shape everyday living in the real world. This is why the nation state as a socio-cultural space is needed for militant religionists. 
there are two strategies that seem to work together in holding together the manner by which muscular religions colonize the socio-cultural space of the nation. First, religious nationalism craftily employs a religio-cultural grand narrative to publicly endorse and reinforce common belief. The nation state becomes a socio-cultural landscape on which the expansion of Hindutva, the mother of all narratives, seeks to attain its unification by harmonizing common blood, common land, and common culture. Hindutva, as all of you know, first articulated in 1923 by Sarvakar, carefully braided three strands of blood, land, and religion into a cogent religio-cultural national narrative. As a biological community with common blood, Hindus were invited to glory in their common religious culture and devote themselves to flourish in their sacred land. So Sarvarkar puts this really well. He says, we Hindus are bound together not only by the ties of love we bear to a common fatherland, but by the common blood that courses through our veins and keeps our hearts throbbing and our affections warm, but also by the ties of common homage we pay to our great civilization, our Hindu culture. We are one because we are a nation, a race, and a common civilization. Second, religious ideologies desire the nation state as a concrete space for translation of macro belief into everyday micro practices for all citizens that live in that space. This often occurs by the use of violence meted out against other religious and secular communities. Propagators of absolute sacred truths collaborate with stealthy promoters of fixed social cultural practices in such a nation state that is being colonized by muscular religions. Strong nation states in the 21st century tap into the religions across the world. As a 2017 Pew Research study states, more than 80 countries favor a specific religion, either as an official government endorsed religion or by affording one religion preferential treatment over other faiths. Let me repeat this because this is a 2017 study by Pew Research that looked at the ascendancy of strong religion across the world. It says more than 80 countries favor a specific religion, either as an official government endorsed religion or by affording one religion preferential treatment over other faiths. So differing ways in which Christians work to take over the United States and Zambia, Muslims work to take over the nation state of Afghanistan and Malaysia, Buddhists work to take over Bhutan and Sri Lanka, and Hindus were to take over the nation state of India and Nepal. So this is really a worldwide phenomenon of which India really is, uh, one can say almost a shining example. So while the protection and promotion of religion by the nation state is mostly written into the constitution by countries where Islam and Christianity are majority religions, India and United States of America claim to keep religion and state separate. However, increasingly, Hinduism and Christianity play a central role in influencing politics and aspiring citizens to carve out a Hindu or a Judeo-Christian socio-political order that violates the rights of those of other religious traditions and other secularists that do not accept the meta-narrative of Hinduism or Christianity. 
even if steeped in resources that can heal the world, religions have recast the capacity and credence of their own agency to damage the world. They have channelized religious faith, which bubbled within inflamed hearts to spill over calculatingly into the social and cultural world. Such shrewd capture of the nation state has led to the concerted, even if hidden, injurious actions of majority religions against minority religions. Now, it's really important to keep in mind that violence is built into most of these religious traditions that have become muscular religions. As you know, as different from Ambedkar and Gandhi, harness a narrow and exclusivist element of Hinduism to foster religious hegemony that was unabashedly militant. Sarvaka was not merely untroubled by violence, but his writings are steeped in a desire for revenge against those who have humiliated Hindus. His pitch to co-religionists are straightforward. I want all Hindus to get themselves reacted and reborn into a martial race. Hindutva was a socio-cultural vision for muscular religion in India. Commenting upon the Hindu fundamentalist mythology spun around Sarvakar, who is referred to with the prefix veer of fearless by his admirers. Chetan Bhatt summarizes, he says, the overarching theme in his hagiographies are undoubtedly those of uncompromising Hindu militancy, violence, masculine strength, and daring, both against the British colonial rule and against Muslims. We could include Indian Christians, unconforming Dalits, and resisting Adivasis into this camp of misfits into the socio-cultural vision represented by aggressive Hindutva. The apparent self-serving nexus between muscular religion and nationalist ideology is indicative of a systemic collusion that remains for the most part denied by both parties and yet growing in dangerous ways in the nation state of India. So if this is the challenge, what is the prospect of religion as the ethical practice of justice in the public square? Religion can also play a constructive role in public life. After all, at the heart of religions is the welfare of all human beings in this life. The promise of the blessed life, which is represented as abundant life in Christianity, is always a community gift. It is shared. It is lived in between communities and for the welfare of all of creation. So in the rest of this presentation, I wish to explore a change in model needed if religion is to be the ethical practice of justice in the public square. Using the metaphor of the body, I will discuss two pathways open to religion, both claiming to be ethical. One is in the business of binding the body for the sake of peaceful order, while the other frees the body for the performance of justice. Of course, one cannot speak as if one is a pan-religionist. So I address this matter as a passionate Christian who also tries to be compassionately interreligious. Let me register a preliminary comment before I go into the two models. I believe that religions in the public square that desire to contribute to the ethical practice of justice will need to realign around the economy of life rather than an economy of salvation. Let me say this again. 
religions in the public square that desire to contribute to the ethical practice of justice will need to realign around the economy of life rather than an economy of salvation. This does not mean that salvation is not the goal of religions. Rather, it means critical and constructive reflections on the content and the boundaries of salvation will pass through the highway of the intricacies of everyday, ordinary, mundane life. I have before you the quotation by someone that most of you would have read, John Sabrino. He instructs the vast assembly of theologians and ethicists to concentrate on the historical social salvation in the context of our gravely ill society. He says, salvation is life over against poverty, infirmity, and death, which incorporates then dignity, freedom, fraternity, and pure air. The economy of life now as granted on earth thus reconfigures an economy to live as children of God under one creator, here and now. So subverting Apostle Paul, one can say that for religions to be the ethical practice of justice, the reality of consecrated life we see face to face takes precedence over visions of eternal life appearing in a mirror dimly. I'm riffing off 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Religion as ethical practice of justice involves paying attention to every aspect of life of the self and one's neighbor. It cannot separate divine righteousness from justice among human beings. Jean-Pierre Rousse reminds us of the actual concreteness and yet divine potential of the economy of life. He says, lived daily experience is always situated and always concrete. It is always someone's lived daily life, irreducible to the anonymity of extraction. It takes place in the ordinary. It is always incarnate, embodied of this world, and yet it points beyond itself, open to encountering and engaging the experiences of others in all their difference and all their shared resonances. The economy of life emerges from walking on the soil and wading in the ocean in togetherness as interreligious person. The challenge for religions is to muster coalitions of religious communities across India that accept the pleasure and pain of doing justice within the stickiness of life within which we all live, move, and have our being. Now to the two models of religion in the public square that, that operate from dissimilar locations to achieve different goals. So let me put my let, let me put my proposition in the form of, of an assertion so that it's clear. I submit that religion committed to the ethical practice will need to sift, shift from a preoccupation with order to the performance of justice. So there are two competing models of religion as practice of ethics in the public square. The first is the well-established model from above in which religion functions to enforce the ethics of order in the public square by binding human society for the sake of peace. Let me repeat that. The first model is a well-established one from above in which religion functions to enforce the ethics of order in the public sphere by binding human society for the sake of peace. The second 
is a somewhat more daring model from below, in which religion functions to perform justice in the public square by freeing human beings for the well being of all. So let's look at both these models. So let's start with the first. The first model, as I said, religion as enforcement of ethics of order in the public square. Religion as enforcement of ethics of order in the public square, which is another way of saying it is fashioning peace from the consecrated head. Hindutva emerged from taking the body of God as a critical reference. All of us know this, those of us who come from India. So there does not appear to be much historical preoccupation, like some of us Christians have, about getting into the mind of God to determine his or her will in order to execute it obediently. Rather, Fully reflecting the honor of God's body in the world is the collective aim of muscular Hinduism. This is built into the organic ontological relatedness between God as creator and human society as God's creation. The sacred Vedas in oral form circulated from about 1500 of the before the common era, theologically talks about the four human castes emanating from God itself, which is from Brahma itself. And from his mouth came the Brahmin, arms, the Kshatriyas, Thai, the Vaishyas, and feet, the Shudras. The perfection of God is manifested in the perfectly ordered human social body. The human social body is nothing other than the manifestation of the body of God. Thus, the orderly organization and functioning of human society as designed by God at creation is what matters to the vision of a convinced Hindu of the muscular religion sort. The onus for them is to order the social body of human community to perfectly reflect the hierarchically given divine orderliness. And this is what drives Hindutva ethics. So this is an ethic in itself. So Anderson and Damle see this as the heart of RSS ideology and functioning. Let me quote them. They say, the corporate Hindu nation is identified as a living God. The metaphor of divine mother is used to describe both the nation and the sacred geography where the nation resides in order to honor the body of God. So this model of society is the body of God that needs to reflect divine hierarchical order, brings about an ethic of monitoring the individual bodies and the collective social body. So Dipanka Gupta makes this correlation clear. He says, as the caste theory of personhood is extremely biological, it is not at all surprising that the body metaphor should pervade large chunks of our social life. Good Hindus must join in the monitoring and maintaining of dharmic order, both in the individual body and the social body. Thus, the Hindu fundamentalist must guard the social body, watchfully defending it against all alien members that wish to enter in order to pollute the sacred entity by endangering its purity. Gupta uses the combat metaphor to describe his dynamic. Let him be quote Dipankar Gupta again. He says, according to the caste system, the body is a fortress constantly under siege from forces without and hence all openings must be carefully monitored, end of quote. Hindu fundamentalists are thus also in the hard nose, often violence ridden real estate business of constructing the land of Hindustan for constituting a Hindu social order. They reclaim geography for the purposes of religious politics. And this indeed is an ethical pathway that in fact should work itself out in the body of the nation state. 
as a Christian, I see this model is also a dominant one in our churches. There is theological justification in Christianity for a from above body polity that is head centric. Apostle Paul constantly talks about Christ as the head of the church. For example, in contrast to God putting all things under his feet, that means everybody under his feet as equals, Paul will present Christ as the head over all things for the church. The church heads have tended to order the community to fit into Christ the head as we recognize the gift of belonging differently to the one body. There is no doubt that it does have a head weighted design. So I think it's very important for us when we criticize others, we should have the humility to also look within so that we also are self-critical. So even if we acknowledge the multiplicity of members bound together by the claim that this is a community set free for God, there is much that goes on in the church that privileges the head and dishonors the feet. Christianity often gets bogged down with the mechanics of managerial power that reflects all the traits of a numb organization directed from the head while touting the language of being a living organism for the life of the world. Let me say that again. Christianity often gets bogged down with the mechanics of managerial power that reflects all the traits of a numb organization directed from the head while touting the language of being a living organism for the life of the world. Conforming to the order envisioned by the head for peaceful purposes so that there was no disturbance without any thought of justice is more apparent within most of the life of our churches. The gospel of transforming the world for justice with peace so that all may have abundant love. Life is covered under a bushel basket most of the time. And yet, there is another model that we should continuously reflect upon and mine for the purposes of religion as ethical performance. So the second model is religion as ethical performance of justice. And this comes from feet wisdom that wells up to liberate the whole body. If cementing order for peace is the objective of religion emanating from the head, uniting wounds of affliction on a march to liberation might well signal an alternate bottom-up model of religion as ethical performance. Such performance is dictated by agitating feet rather than the dreaming head. It starts from the furthermost part of the body to almost make the head spin. It wells up from the feet that are firmly planted on the ground and moves up to free the entire body. Coming from a theological strand that values resistance from the base that is often debased, affliction can be strung together to denounce alienation, marginalization, and oppression, and activate justice for the well being of all human beings. In India, to take the image of society as a body of God, such ethical performance of justice must emanate from the strident march of the 200 million Dalits in India. They were considered the dust under the feet of the body politic of the caste community in which the priests were represented as the head. Interestingly, in human anatomy, what is base is likely to be what is the furthest from the sense organs situated in the head. The feet are a good example of being designated polluted and unclean. So feet wisdom coming out 
of alienation, marginalization, and suffering becomes a source of envisioning and engendering justice and practices that will lead to justice for all. There is a notable difference between the modes of thinking of these models. Heady thinking tends to be based on harmonizing order. The well being of the body is a state of feeling good in the head while remaining quite indifferent to the weight that is borne by the feet. Justice here is sacrificed for peace. It celebrates how all things belong together for the crowning of the exalted head. Conversely, feet-based thinking tends to be based on resistance to an order that fits too tightly, peace that is constrictive. It is fueled by the pathos of unbelonging to the rest of the body, which is the resistant power that moves towards liberation. It is from the basest and most dishonored that the hardy bonds of defiant unbelonging are knit together to break chains of affliction and advance the promise of freedom and liberation. Let me end by pointing to the untapped religious potential of feet wisdom for the performance of justice in the public sphere. Many dimensions of this wisdom may be theoretically professed by the heady caste and classes, but they are really profoundly experienced by the communities that represent the weary souls of the body of society. And when I say souls, I say it's written out as S-O-L-E-S, -E not S-O-U-L, souls, the weary souls of the body. Feet wisdom for religion, to be the ethical practice of justice for the well-being of all is crucial because of two important factors. On the one hand, the feet bear the weight of the entire body. Unlike the head that has the privilege to sit high and mighty on the body, the feet have the responsibility to take on the entire load of the body. It works for the whole body and takes on the responsibility of keeping the body upright, active, and mobile. The feet's intuition allows the social body to decide when to work and when to rest, when to stand and when to sit, and when to move forward and when to retreat. These become the elements of what is just in a social system, rather than the head deciding how, in fact, we can keep all things at peace. And in being attentive to this feet, the wisdom of the feet, the whole body is restored. The feet must be made to symbolize the coming together of all castes and classes that bear the weight of the social body. The politics of only celebrating singular identities must be refigured, reconfigured for a sense of uniting in the feet, all those who are debased and bear the weight of a hierarchical social body. Dalits, the poor working class, Adivasis, laboring women, religious minorities, and even sexual minorities find new belonging in the march towards freedom from the ethics of segmented order that is brought about by heady envisioning. There's a second thing that we can learn from feet wisdom. We should keep in mind that the feet are the closest to the terrain of Mother Earth. What is justice for all creation may be said to be relayed as feet wisdom mainly by barefoot workers that walk experientially knowing the rhythm of the earth. This is a dimension of justice that spills over from the anthropocentric fixation that most of us are consumed with. Soul knowledge, 
S O L E, knowledge. From disciples, striding on the soil informs the head to be plugged into that which is eternally echoed by the fragile earth, our island home. Religion, as ethical practice of religion, if attuned to the feet planted on the soil of toiling men and women, will teach us to think and act ecologically and justly. As Achille Membe reminds us, to reopen the future of our planet for all who inhabit it, we will have to learn how to share it again among humans, but also between humans and non-humans, between the multiple species that populate our planet. Thank you, dear friends. Thank you, Sandeep, for that profound uh, presentation of the theme, which you have explained in a very concrete manner. Uh, friends, uh, if I can uh, uh, look at his presentations, I can put it that he was putting it in the four points, the major points. First of all, he has mentioned about the religion in the contextual form the masculine religion under which that we are all placed in. And also in that, uh, you also mentioned that uh, the fundamentalism and other aspect of dominant religions, which is now being very much been alive in our contextual situation, that he has highlighted in various ways. And also you went to the extent of saying that the religion justifies with a selective text in order to use this uh, dominant uh, religion. And also the religion talks about the dualistic uh, worldview and makes that worldview as uh, present worldview as unreal and something that we have expected. So this is also a kind of a justification that religion has played. And in that context, he has also brought down to the level of our own present in this world ideology on which that the religion is how is controlled. And in that way, he was talking about the nexus between politics and religion. And the politics which its rule over us with the ideology of Hindutva, which is majoritarian of one culture, one religion, one language, and one tradition. And so in the context of creation by Sati, was clearly mentioned about the masculine religion and then under which that we are placed. Secondly, uh, in the second part, if I remember that uh, Sati was talking about the economy of life and the economy of salvation. And uh, yes, they are very happy that, you know, the discussions which we had yesterday about this. And we are rightly we point. I think there's a spirit working on us, even though we are not part of it in our discussions. And uh, you know, the religion is matters with economy of life rather than saving of the souls. Uh, economy of life this involves the total life in fullness. Maybe Jesus came in order that we will have life, life in abundance. And so that is the basis of the expectation of religion. And also he highlighted saying that uh, more than 83 countries are... So the, thank you very much for the presentation, I am Moses. <laughs> uh, I have uh, four questions, basically. Number one is Hinduism. A fundamentalist or a communist? Fundamentalist is something where you have a textbook, where you have the fundamentals. And uh, Hinduism does not have, in my humble opinion, uh, certain fundamentals, because it is uh, fundamentals are many. But they are more communists. They want to divide society into various classes and communities. And therefore, uh, uh, I would uh, prefer to call Hinduism as a communist religion rather than a fundamentalist religion. They divide people. Uh, even if I want to be a Hindu, 
where will they put me? Will I be a Brahmin or a Satya? That, that kind of thing. That, that's one. Number two, Hindus, you are quoting uh, Savakar and all. That is the controversy that uh, they want to call everyone Hindu, including perhaps uh, the, the Christians and the Muslims, uh, they want to call the possible as Hindus. That is their controversy uh, to the, the Western world uh, to claim their Hindu national kind of uh, thing. Um, whereas in the uh, in the Indian context, every political party is a nation, every caste is a nation originally, and every, every political party has uh, uh, every caste has a nation uh, 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 political concept now. So we are fighting on the lines of caste based on political party. So the 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 the, the, the Mayavadi, the UP, um, uh, Yadavs, and uh, only perhaps in the, in the, in the south, there's an inclusive Dravidian kind of a culture where all the caste uh, can be put on forget and form a party. But otherwise, the, the premise is that we are all Hindus, therefore, India belongs to Hindus, that is being questioned by the political formations in the yeah. So we do not want to fall and to be called as Hindus or Indians are Hindus. No. Uh, third uh, thing is about uh, the your, uh, characterization of uh, uh, the church, uh, Paul putting Christ as the head. And I have no problem because Paul does not say Christ is the head man. Christ is a head. That means without the body, Christ is nobody. Whereas in the Indian thing, they are independently, the, the people who came from the head are independent. They can live without the rest. But the Christ is only the head, not the head man. So you being a theologian, you can put some more light. The final point is, after listening to Gabriela Dietrich this morning, who is very much here. Uh, I would have been very comfortable and happy to see the feet of a woman because that, a woman's feet is still bearing the feet of men, though there is a cast or whatever. So that is also. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, uh, Moses Manor, and good, good actually, even though. I, I can't see everybody clearly. I have a good sense of some of you and brings back lots of old memories. Um, so, so thank you very much. So, so some of yours are comments actually that, that really help us to, to think through this in the Indian context. Um, I will not actually uh, defend much of what I said because I think you know better. I mean, having talked about the feet on the ground, um, I'm the head that's been far away for a long time. So I will not pretend that, in fact, I, I can defend this. However, let me make a couple of comments that will be helpful to all of us. Uh, the first is I absolutely agree that, that uh, uh, your idea, that the whole idea of fundamentalism really uh, came through about 150 years ago and really has its origins in the US um, with, with Christian fundamentalisms. It was a self-claimed title. They were very proud of it. And they still are in many ways, and so it's 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 uh, uh, somewhat disingenuous to paint everybody with the same brush. So so I, I agree with you, and that's one of the reasons why in this particular presentation, um, I cease to use religious fundamentalism. That I I've, I've written a book on competing religious fundamentalism, um, but I've ceased, and I I think muscular religion, particularly the Kshatriya sort. Um, uh, where, where uh, you know, muscular arms with conniving heads is a good way in which to talk about this, as, as you said, a, a communal project, a communal project that actually has taken on a, a national frame. Uh, so so I, I think I agree with you uh, in terms of, of your recasting 
how we talk about this. Um, your second notion about all all uh, religions, really religious adherents are Hindus. Um, is is uh, 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 again, it's somewhat of an Advaitic position uh, that everybody in the end is the same. But let's not forget that Christians tend to do this as well. Um, uh, Rana's conception of anonymous Christian was that, in fact, somehow um, everyone basically is a Christian and included into the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So I, I think that there's, there is a problem with, with trying to paint. Uh, uh, everybody as a Christian or any, everybody as a Hindu. And I clearly agree. I, 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 I didn't use the word conspiracy, but clearly I use um, the creativity and the cunning of the ways in which actually people have, have spin, uh, uh, spun this narrative is something that I actually uh, think is important. So uh, your other point about uh, trying to save Christianity's public face, um, I've constantly taken another position. So I, I'm willing, um, and I address this a lot in the work that I've done. Um, I think that Christian scripture do have a lot of toxic texts of violation and violence. Um, in fact, the Muslims will remind us that the only scriptures that allow basically for genocide are not Islamic scriptures, but in fact, Christian scripture, you know, where there's a lot of uh, ways in which God allows us to actually go out and do things in God's command. So my sense is that, yes, we can interpret Christ differently. And as a constructive theologian, I constantly try to work with what this means for, for, for us. How do we actually look at hierarchy, Christianity, church polity, and how we, do we redefine this? by looking basically at Christ as representing much of, of, of uh, the democratic ways in which we try to move toward justice and peace. So I, I, I think, you know, you picked up a piece and said, yes, this is possible. Um, I also will work, you know, to see there are lots of ways in which we cannot uh, uh, um, get away from the fact that there's a lot in the Jesus that we know that primarily was collectively part of communities that basically were debased. And that was a conscious choice. So, so I, I think I agree with you that in fact, we need to keep stretching and straining various texts in order to work for another model of what and how we can be together um, um, as Christians with other communities of faith. Uh, I, 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 I wish I had taken the feet of a woman um, um, that's, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, um, the, the, uh, both feet of men and women of the laboring caste. Uh, I found that 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 picture really attractive because of the fact that it 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 is soiled, it's hardened, and I, I I think clearly there's a gender insensitivity. Probably I should have put two different uh, ways in which one can represent this. So I definitely take that positive. And so next time I turn something around, I'll be much more careful about the slides that I think. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, for your presentation. And thank you for talking about the wisdom that, that we're building up from the board. And uh, this bit uh, of wisdom when it's manifested uh, in the migrant labors, because we tread it down thousands of miles, uh, uh, during the first phase of uh, lockdown uh, in India, they were just, they were there enough to get out of the, 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 the system that, that, that excludes them, you know. So uh, this field of wisdom that demands uh, a differently able business, you know, to, to, to provide a room for an otherwise able wisdom so that we can redefine the nationhood. And that should be uh, complemented with the uh, wisdom of the womb also, I think. Wisdom of the womb that uh, from, a, from a feminist perspective, particularly uh, we are when the seeds we are waiting for the business and also the doctrine of incarnation at the beginning of Christianity. That's talking about the book of wisdom, particularly. Uh, 
साइट उसमें नीचे नीचे आप इसको देखा क्योंकि यह सिर्फ so so you you were breaking up quite a lot but if just just i i got your first part but was the second part basically wound or womb womb is it womb wisdom or wound wisdom wound or womb 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 so uh, womb you know, wisdom of the womb yeah great excellent no i i i i completely agree with you see as you know there's only so much you could go you you can pick up every part and work with it but again uh, i i i think i was using a lot of 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 what happens based on the body as understood by hindutva so that's basically why i work with this i think there's a lot of work done by both womanist and feminist in terms of the wisdom of the womb so i think that's a very important dimension of what and how uh, we can work with this but as you know within a short address one is really limited so and particularly because we're on zoom uh, i wanted to keep this as brief and as pointed as possible but but i i really appreciate uh, your comment as well because in one sense you can basically bring feet with heart with womb with hands um, and and panika talks a lot about skin what he calls cutaneous knowledge um, so there's a lot of ways in which uh, we can work with every form of knowing that represents the fullness of the body and i think you're particularly right because divine wisdom as basically the compassion that comes from the womb is a very important component of of particularly some of the work that's been done by elizabeth johnson um, so so thank you so much for that thank you sati it's a, it's a delight to hear you again it says sharpness it is in fact though you are out you are rooted and then by your studies and with your own presentation we understand how much you are really connected with us in that level and uh, this will be more appropriate concluding session i believe because uh, some of the things which you have uh, spoken in this uh, session we have already had little bit of discussions for the last two days every aspect of it and so we are thankful to him for all the things that he has concluded even though you were not with us for the last two days but you concluded with all the discussion what we had for the last two days we are thankful to you for that vibrancy and uh, looking forward to your continual uh, relationship and the journey that you're going to go with the sisters especially whether we are out or other whether we are coming in here and uh, here we have started the south asian research center a new center in delhi uh, so we want to find the commonality of people in in struggle facing their identity crisis in, in the south asian context in that level i think your involvement is much appreciated to give leadership to this aspect the uh, extended work that we are going to involve from this day forward thank you sati for for your presentation and we are very much thankful to you and may our love and wishes to all in your family there thank you thank you so much and thank you for everyone for listening it's a real pleasure thank you very much